Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is July 3rd, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Ulysses Gore. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, and we're very glad to have you with us. And I understand they called you Yuli. That is correct. It'll be Yuli today. Yuli, may I ask you how old you are? Uh, Thursday morning at 8 o'clock will be the 83rd time I will have seen that hour and day. 83rd. That's right. That is correct. As I told you a few moments ago, you were very well preserved, 83. I might mention I'm number nine in the family. Number nine. And I'm not the baby. The <laughs> baby will be, the baby will be 77 tomorrow. Seven, the baby is 77. Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you keep good records, don't you? <laughs> what is your current address, Julie? My current address is 19 Field Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And your current marital status? My bride just brought me here. She's been my bride for 47 years. Really? That's, that's very nice. Do you have children? We have three children, three daughters. How about grandchildren? We have seven grandchildren. Shall we keep going? Do you have great-grandchildren? On the 31st of March of this year at 1015, we became great-grandparents for the first time. I think I'll stop there with that. We'll anticipate for our wedding anniversary our second great-grandchild. Do you really? That's right. Yuli, where were you born? I was born in born on 154 Pleasant Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts. In Cambridge. And were you raised there? I was raised in Cambridge. I wasn't raised on Pleasant. I was raised in Cambridge. Shortly after my birth, I understand that we purchased, my father purchased property on Pine Street. You know, still in Cambridge, a different part of the city. And uh, we lived there until I left there until after I came out of the military. In 1946, I purchased my own piece of property. In fact, it was the 21st of December, 4 o'clock, 1946, in the Pacifically, when I signed the papers of possession at the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Savings Bank at Harvard Square. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, family, your mom and dad? What did your mom do? And my mother was a... Uh, was a mother and she stayed home. I can understand, looking at my age, and you can understand that it was different than it is now. <clears throat> my father went to work at the Cambridge Gas Company in 1940, no, 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 1914. He was hired by Mr. Haddock, who that was privately owned at the time. And Mr. I remember my father joked about it, that uh, he had never had a, a black person, he's called colored people now anyway, uh, worked for him in that capacity. So he took my father on as a, on trial to see if it was going to work out. And finally, in 1944, he decided it wasn't going to work out. <laughs> it wasn't going to work out. After 30 years? He retired, but every time he was retired off in 1944. Just not going to work. And that was the joke that uh, he went there as a temporary employee to see if it was going to work out. And my mother, she uh, she raised all of us, us kids. She was a very, she was a real mother, a real stern person. Um, while I did not appreciate everything that she did and said with me during my growing up, as I look back at her right now, I appreciate. In fact, when she died, I said I always told, I said that Mama taught school, and she taught a good, good school. She taught her students good. And when school was over, she left. She had a heart attack and died. And I always felt that being raised like being in school. My father was a good, my father was uh, of Cherokee Indian, this Cherokee Indian descent from the Catawba tribe. He was very, very stern, very quiet. Uh, he didn't bother people. But he always said he was, I'm the president, I'm the vice president, 
I'm the Congress, I'm the Constitution. My word is law. And if you can't live by my rules, live someplace else. And that's how he raised us. And he was very stern. And I, when, he, when Papa died, I, I, I realized that I had, had one of the best teachers in the world. I, I must mention something also. Shortly before Papa died, uh, he called me down the house one day. He said, I want to give you something, some pair of shoes. And he came in, he gave me a pair of old brown shoes. They weren't, they weren't even good for work at that, but he wanted me to have those shoes. And what he was telling me, I wanted to step into, into my shoes. And he gave me the shoes. And I think that uh, if more of that was going on today, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. He sounds like he was a good teacher too. Papa know. was good. He was. Yeah. I mean, uh, he he belted me a few times. He belted me. You know, he belted me. My mother belted me. I mean, there's no getting away from that. I got a few blows, and whatnot. But by getting those blows. They were telling that us kids, if you do wrong, you have to pay for it. And that's what it amounted to. Can you tell us about uh, what schools you went to in Cambridge? First, I went to the Boardman School, and the building is still there, on the corner of School and Windsor Street. And my first teacher was, her name was Florence McCarty. And I went to the second grade in that school. My second teach, great teacher was named was uh, Nadine Wright. I must say about Miss McCarty, though. Uh, some years later, oh, 50 years, something years later, yeah, oh, not 30, 40 years later, well, anyway, Miss McCarty died. And I saw it in the newspaper, so I went over to the, to the wake, and I walked into the wake. You know, all these old people looking all soft and whatnot. And, yeah. and a young priest walked over to me. He said, uh, good afternoon. He said, I'm Mrs. Flynn's son. I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you about your mother. I said, I want to put a flower on her casket. That your mother was my first grade teacher. And this dignified priest yelled out, what? Yes, then all that I, academically, I owe it all to your mother because she started me. I said, and incidentally, I might mention that your father was my seventh grade algebra teacher. Oh, really? So I had your family two ways down the street. <laughs> Excuse me, this is getting in the way oh. of the camera. Thank you. My second grade teacher, Miss Nadine Wright, uh, she was a Radcliffe grad, and that was in her second class she ever had. She was a, uh, she was a black woman. Uh, she, t interesting about my relationship with Miss Wright, Miss Wright, um, she taught me, she taught my sister Stacia and my sister Thelma. And in those days, when you got married, you couldn't stay teaching. So she had to leave. And Two decades or so later, she came back to teach and taught my oldest nephew. Yuli, as you were growing older in <coughs> Cambridge, and you, did you go to high school in Cambridge? I went to Cambridge High and Latin School. Uh, and you joined the military, I think, in 1942. That's correct. Can you remember back to, uh, say, 1941, Pearl Harbor came along? I was at it Fort Banks. There was a war. Uh, and you were you in high school then? No, I came out of Cambridge Latin in 1935. I graduated in 1935. Okay, so I was very young. What were you doing at Pearl Harbor at, at the time of Pearl Harbor? I was working for the. I had taken a position, uh, my first civil service position. In fact, I that was on the 16th of June, 1941, at Fort Banks. Where, where, was, where is that? That's outside of Winthrop. On the coast, on the out on the coast. And what sort of work were you doing there? I was in the I was in the uh, I was in the uh, I was the what you call it, head of fancy name for culinary department. 
and I, I was there for, uh, I was there for a year, but um, then I went in the military. I did not volunteer for the military. I don't get that gets this straight. I got dragged into the, like everybody. I got dragged. You uh, were drafted. I was drafted. <clears throat> I am no big hero. I was drafted. And you were called up when? I was called the first of June, and I was in, and I took the oath June 16, 1942. 1942. Did uh, other guys that you knew from your neighborhood or school, or or work, go in with you? No. Or you were strictly alone. Yeah. Tell us about being called up and leaving home. Well, at the time I went into the military, I was not living at home. I had got to be 21, and I was going to spread my wings. And um, I guess my number came up, and that was it. I, I interesting that um, I was very friendly with the head of the draft board's daughter. And when I got my papers, I went over to see her that night. I showed her the papers. She said, give me half those papers. And she went to see her father. So her father sent for me. So I went in and I said, Mr. I addressed him and he said, uh, so what do you want me to do? And I said to him, he always addressed me as Mr. Gore. And I said to him, if my number has come up, I am no better than anybody else. And if it's my time to go, I'm ready to go. And he said, you know, you're crazy. There's 99 million guys would jump to the chance to get out of it. I said, that's not the way we would do it. He said, you wouldn't have any respect for me if I did. And I would not really have much respect for myself. And from that minute on, he then addressed me by my first name. Is that right? That's right. I was Mr. Gold and I went in that office. When I came out, I was Ulysses. And we had the highest of regard and respect for each other until the day he died. So I went in. Where did you go? We left. Huntington Avenue, went to Fort Devens. In Fort Devens, I went to uh, Camp Lee. That was a quartermaster head, uh, headquarters. And that's where I had my basic training. <clears throat> and then from there, I went and stayed at Camp Lee, went to the quartermaster school, where I was trained in uh, supply, personnel, the administrative portion of the military. And then I was assigned to the 247th uh, Service Battalion at uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. When, when you were called up, uh, you were drafted. I was drafted. Did you have any choice whatsoever as to what service you were doing to? None. <clears throat> Army, Navy, Marines, anything? I had none. And when you went to Fort Devens and before the quartermaster school, did you take tests or have We were given choices? bags of testing and um, uh, issue, in, uh, issue clothing and physicals and uh, batteries of testing. That's the whole ball game. So that led you going to the quartermaster school? I had no choice in it. But the result of the test? The result of that, yeah. So you, you had some uh, talents for what the, the Army needed in the quartermaster. Well, I suppose that's what, they, that's what came up with. And now you're in Louisiana? I'm in Louisiana. And um, that was a service battalion, which I didn't understand much about it, but I was, I was a personnel clerk, clerk there and with a battalion, with the battalion headquarters. And uh, I was there from... Uh, September until the following February. And then I got assigned to a unit in Mississippi, Camp Van Dorn, Mississippi. It was a 512 truck regiment. Which Trucks? We had, truck. We, it was a newly formed unit where we trained men to uh, operate jeeps, all type, of, all type of motor vehicles, six wheelers, trailers, the whole ball game. What did you yourself do? Were you still as a regiment supply? Okay, and describe the work you did. Well, a regiment supply. Part of my duties were uh, we 
We supplied the entire regiment with everything, with food. We ran the ration breakdown, uh, clothing, equipment. It was a, it was, <laughs> we supplied the regiment. We were the mother and father who earned the money to buy them the clothes and all. And it was a, it was a heavy duty outfit. You were in the South. Uh, had you ever been in the South before? Nope. And that was we the most traumatic experience I ever had. Can you tell us about that? Well, I had known that there was, between uh, races, there was, that there wasn't a lot of closeness. I was aware of that. But my fact, to be suddenly dumped into a spot that was in Washington, D.C. in the morning, we're on our way from down to Virginia, and I saw my first sign said white and colored. That was in, in, the, in the Union Station, looking at the Capitol. Um, we had breakfast there because the, the way it was done is that we were in uniform, so we were given a whole, I think that the, that part of that Union Station restaurant was reserved for the military anyway. So that would, but when I got into, uh, that was my first, imp, my first contact with this sort of thing. And then I got into Virginia, Camp Lee. Uh, it, it eased in because we were, you were kept in your own units. But what happened that made me, my real facing of it was that this, I was going into Richmond on a Sunday morning, with a, we're all going to Richmond. So we ended up Petersburg, we got on the Greyhound bus, and I met some Caucasian kids from uh, East Boston and from Southport. We had found each other. We got on the bus, and uh, then the driver of the bus came and said that to him I had to move to the back of the bus. But, so this kid wanted to go to the back of the bus. So we're all, that's the rule. He said, well, we all come out of Roxbury and Cambridge and whatnot all together. He said, if we're on the bus together, then what's wrong here? So it was quite a fuss about it. Anyway, that was my first encounter of, that, of, this, of this situation. When you <clears throat> served in uh, Louisiana and later in Mississippi, was yours an all-black outfit, or did you have officers? Or? The officers were white, were Caucasian. And um, that didn't sit well with me not just because we're Caucasian, but I happened to overhear a conversation with these white officers talking about their boys. And I'm 21 years old. I'm 21 years old. And I was long, my old long old boy. And the result being that I resented, I even used to duck parades and whatnot, because I didn't want to walk behind a Caucasian who's going to call me a boy. And I used to duck these parades, too. It was just, it was just awful. In, uh, in Louisiana and later in Mississippi, did the nature of your work change or did you continue to do the same kind of thing? I still am administrative. Quarter mastering. I still am, I was administrator for the, for the quartermaster corps. At this point, um, did you guys feel you were preparing to go overseas or get ready to do what? Well, let me get to, um, when we left Camp Lee, we had the impression we were going to, not, we, were, we were going to be combat. Uh, let me second ask that question the right way now. I'll have to move, have to move a few, move up further. Uh, we realized that we were going to be going into a in the combat areas, we'd we'll be going overseas, and that sort of that said combat to me. And uh, so, but the the truck part of it, yes, we felt we were, was going to be combat, of course. Then I was moved. I got I was moved from that unit. To, I was sent to a warrant officer school to become a warrant officer that was into Texas. So I left Mississippi with a truck outfit 
got sent to a warrant after school in, te in Texas. For the, the purposes of people looking at this tape a long time from now, would you describe <coughs> what a warrant officer is? Yeah, before I do that, I want to go back to, uh, back to uh, New Orleans, to, to this feeling, of, this racial thing, that it even in, it, it was even into the religious part of, that I say that for this one reason. One, the second week we were there on a Sunday morning, we went to chapel, the chapel with Lieutenant Colonel, and I remember he said that for, there would be a nigger service at 6 o'clock. And that's the last time I went to that chapel. I a tied nigger it with service? It. A nigger service. That's when he got up standing with his crowd in front of, in front of us. And uh, I, I just, I didn't say a word, but I never went back. Now I get to the Warren Office. The Warren Office was a, the Warren Office Corps was created uh, shortly, I understand, shortly after World War I. There were a lot of men who had been Commissioners, lieutenants during World War One on field field commissions, and wanted to stay in the military, and you could, didn't know what to do with them. And they had this high expertise, yet you couldn't relegate them back to a, a lower grade. So the the water pop was the water pop, and then created this office warrant officer class. They were in between commission officers, yet they weren't. They, they were below a commission officer, yet above a non-commissioned officer. And that's where they came in at. I understand the warrant officer class was then, it been since that time, been disbanded. It was, it was very heavy in the, uh, what was in the Air Corps, the, uh, war, the warrant officer class was. You haven't mentioned, um you, you mentioned your technical training, quartermaster, and with working with large trucks and things like that. Were you trained to be a, an infantryman as well? Were you good with a yes, rifle? Yes, we had infantry something? training. We had we had to we had infantry training and uh, firearms. That's we had to all that sort of stuff. And uh, it was there. Okay. We had it. Did you go on maneuvers and that kind of thing? A couple of times I went on maneuvers in Louisiana, in Louisiana a couple, couple of times. And um, I think, well, a couple of times when I was in Texas. Now let me, this is such a hodgepodge. So from the one off of the school, I completed all my course, completed everything. I was near the, near the top of my class. But for some reason, that's when I felt again this racial thing. Um, it was awful because I was getting also, not a, also oppression because from black fellas also because of where I come from. I was in a, in a unit where I was the only person in the unit who lived north of North Carolina, black or white. I, I, was, a, I was a real minority. <laughs> And I had, was getting impression from people about my speech. And my, I remember one time, a Robert A. Pearson, was captain, he said to me, um, I have a hard time understanding you. Why don't you bless, why don't you speak so I can understand you? And I said, Captain Pearson, did it ever dawn upon you that I have as much difficulty understanding you as you understand me? He said, I speak pure English. That I come from a place where we speak pure English. Did he seem to understand what you were saying to him? <laughs> he just scratched his head and, walked and left. He was Caucasian from out of, uh, he was out of Virginia. He, he just, um, and I used to had a lot of, uh, lot of the black fellows. They didn't understand me. They didn't understand my verbiage. I, interesting about that, because I remember once we went out, I was out somewhere, I was down outside of a college campus in Louisiana. And on a sunny afternoon, and I was talking, and all of a sudden I noticed a little, oh, it doesn't so good, was sitting on the floor just listening to me, they gapping at me. And these fellows were all mad. And what it was that the girls, one came and said, they just, that your speech is so different. And it's like, he not, they had never heard, not that I'm that great, but they never heard pure English. I mean, pure English. That's right, they never heard it. And I used to get an awful time from a lot of guys because of the way I spoke. 
in this school that you went to, <coughs> was that whites and blacks? It was all, it was all, uh, all black students and all white teachers. And there I had a lot of fun there too. <coughs> so you've told us that uh, did you, you graduated or at least completed it, but they didn't make you a warrant officer? I was graduated, but I was never, I got my papers and all, but I was never allowed to assume the duty of a warrant. I was, I was never, I never was allowed to accept my commission. So what was your rank at this time? Sergeant. Sergeant. At, le at least they gave you three stripes. I was went there as a sergeant. Yeah. I, I went to the school as a sergeant. So all you got was experience. Experience and learning. I had a lot of, I had a lot of fun. I mean, I, you might want it, both the, the examinations, like the paperwork was all finished. The examinations were oral. And the first time I went in, they were taken in one by one. And uh, my tank, I went in, and there was, there was Captain Nelson from, from Texas. I remember him very specifically. Johnson, Colonel from Texas. Texas, North Carolina, Mississippi, Texas, all Caucasian. Here I am, Black Yankee. And those officers, they gave it to me. They gave it to me. I mean, they really worked me over. And the more correct I was, the more head shaking there was. And finally said I had to come back. So the fall week I was called back in and they took about a dozen of us to bunch of together. And the same board was there going to question again. And this captain gave everybody in that room being questioned at ease except me. And I'm staying at attention. And 99% of the questions were posed, were posed directly at me. To the degree that we came out of that, that exam, a lot of my classmates wonder why did they spend all that time querying you. And, um, but I was never allowed to accept my commission. How about your classmates? What a lot of them got, I was the, the bulk of them did. <coughs> I got my certificates and all, but it was not. <laughs> but not you. Yeah. We have you up to, uh, what, February of 43 now, or was it past that? Uh, we're, f we're 43. But then I get uh, 43. That's when I got to school, I was pulled into the 2nd Cavalry Division. And uh, just doing nothing really. We had, we had, we had mounts, we used, to, we were, used mounts in those days. Real horses? Yeah. In the cavalry, that's... <laughs> it was a second count division. It was a ninth and tenth, ninth and tenth, twenty-something out of four, all mounted troops. In fact, interesting that um, they put on a furlough and had this big, big yellow patch. And we got stopped in New York and wanted to know where, what army I was, I was in. Oh, the horses had... Patch. With the, yeah, the uh, regimental yeah. Uh, division patch. Yeah. No one has, had no, no one knew where they, they were down on the Mexican border. It, and didn't know, knew, no one knew, we were, well, I shouldn't say no one, but no one really, it uh, wasn't known where we were. The average person didn't know anything, didn't know where we were around. I'm going to ask you a question which may seem odd to you, uh, considering what you've just described. But did the military prepare you for cultural differences? No. That you might expect in the future? No, I must, I, I, no, the answer is no. But I must be quite a, sort of fair with them. See, the, the War Department prior to the war was comprised of 90% of Southerners. You can think about it. There was, there was, there weren't any, uh, there weren't any, uh, there, weren't, there were very few active duty military units in New England. What there were were Coast, were, were coast Guard uh, on the artillery office on the, on the coast. The Army was comprised was 90% uh, Southern. So they would only be, the, the Army is only made of people and the people who they are. 
Now we had did have the ninth and tenth cavalry and the twenty fourth. Uh, infantry regiment, another regiment, I can't think of the name right now, those were permanent organizations. But, um, so how could I be, could the ones who were doing these things, how could they prepare me for it when it was a, their way of life? I couldn't, I'm not an engineer. I'm not, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a draftsman. So how could I prepare you to be a draftsman if I'm not a draftsman myself? So these poor, these people, that was their culture, that's the way they lived. So how could they take somebody from New England and, and uh, prepare them for it? Did anybody talk to you about eventually you're going to go overseas and meet different cultures over there? No. We were, the way we went over uh, Of course, by this time the war was getting was warm over there, and we were just... We were just dumped overseas. We were but, told uh, we didn't be talking with any pity and with, we weren't going to be in a place with a lot of friends. Let's not lose track of where you are. Uh, from Louisiana, <coughs> Mississippi, where did you go? Went to Fort Clark, Texas. That's on the Mexican border. You're down on the border there. Yeah, that's, where, that's, that's where the cavalry offer was, down on the Mexican border. And what did you do down there? Well, that's where the school was. The fourth corps, still had your the fourth horses. army had this had this had the school down there for the warrant officers, and uh, when we got out of school, those who didn't take get their commission were, were absorbed into the second cavalry division, into uh, and spread around the division, and I wound up with the um, with the ninth cavalry. I think it was where, eight. Where, we, where was that stationed? Four o'clock, Texas. And you had a horse? I didn't have a horse. There were horses there. At the, you, you had the mounts, and um, you learned to ride a mount, you learned to shoot on, on, on horseback, rifle and, and pistol. And uh, then what happened in 43, that out of a clear blue sky one day, um, the, the, the mounts were all taken away, and there was a lot of going on, and then we were on board, on board trains coming across the United States, coming into to Virginia, to go overseas. And we left. Um, how much? How much were you told about <coughs> uh, where you were going and what you were going to do as a unit? Nothing. Just put you on a train and a. We were just. <coughs> Suddenly, there was a lot of activity, checking your equipment, yak, yak, that sort of thing. And then the horses disappeared. And then there were reassignments, and uh, then uh, one morning, a lot of trains pulled in down at Fort Clark, and we were loaded. We were coming across the, uh, across the United States for two days. I saw something very interesting, though, coming across that. Uh, Coming across from from Texas to into Louisiana, uh, coming across Lake Pontchartrain. That's the, one of the biggest lakes in the country. I think Lake Pontchartrain probably as big as than probably about the size of uh, Cambridge, if not more. What would happen that a train would come in and would then would be backed onto a barge and then barge across the lake. Get picked up by another tr an engine to go on its way. So you got a sea voyage. <laughs> <laughs> it was really something, yeah. Then we came up to um, up to up the James River, and then we did some more checking out, getting ready to go overseas. And one morning, we were put on trucks, and I still we didn't know. St I still didn't know what was going on, but there was this big, big ship. The name of the ship was the USS General Man. Where? What port were you in? Uh, New, Newport News. Newport News, Virginia, yes. just north of Norfolk. The name of the yeah, the name of the ship was the USS General Man, and it was her a maiden voyage. She was one of the fastest ships. Didn't that an escort couldn't she couldn't an escort couldn't work with it because she was too fast. And uh, that's, that ship we went into uh, pulled into uh, Casablanca. Okay, you're headed for Africa. Um, <coughs> What size unit did you sail over in? Well, now we went over as a division. A whole division on, yes, right. on a ship? Yes, right. 
That's a pretty big ship. It was a it was a mammoth thing. And she blew out. She was a big that was a it was a beautiful ship. She was very fast. And how long did it take you to get to California? Well, five days. This is your first sea voyage. That was I that take first, first what, Tell me about that. A guy, a kid out of Cambridge, and suddenly you're crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Well, um, we're going across. I had, of course, I, mean, I studied a lot of geography in school, and uh, when I found I was going to North Af going to North Africa, I knew where I was going, and I had, I had to do a lot of reading, so I wasn't going. I wasn't going to be bewildered what I saw, per se. And it was in, it was, a, it was very fulfilling to go there. I might mention that the at we after we got to North Africa, got to Casablanca, the, we were informed that the ship ahead of us had got torpedoed, and the one behind us had got hit. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> What's the date of your landing there? The North African landings were November of uh, forty three. What? When did you land we at got Casablanca? The, in January forty four. January 44, yeah. so it was already pretty hot stuff. It was still kind of warm. Yeah. But we had, uh, it was still kind of warm. When we landed in what is called a, what they didn't call a stationary, I guess it was called. And uh, at that point, we were all in the impression we were going to, uh, going into combat. And uh, we left Casablanca, we went by, by rail, I had read, I'd heard about the fighting in Nate from World War One. I, I found what it was in World War Two. The same old cattle cars <laughs> fighting in Nate. <laughs> and we rode from Casablanca up to Oran on these cattle cars. That was a couple of days. Tell us about that trip because it's it's that's lovely country, um, and it's new to you. What did you see? Oh, to see the, the terrain, to see the, the having seen uh, pictures as a kid of of the of the uh, the, the, of the mountains, whatnot. That it's sort of rolling type of mountains they were. They were beautiful. This is the Atlas Mountains. Yeah, right? it was beautiful. You, it's, just one or two words to describe. It's beautiful, and uh, to me to realize that I was seeing nearly. The things that I had been taught in school was really, really exciting, really exciting. You see in Arabs too, which is yeah, totally we had different. met a lot of Arabs. Uh, uh, we had encounter with Arabs, and um, in Oran, Oran was very heavily Jewish. Very Jewish, much, yeah. And Explain that. How come? Well, I, uh, there was in, there was a faction there because I remember. Uh, and a trolley car was on the going through in Oran, and this woman, she was a Jewish woman, and the conductor called her Chocho, -cho, called her call her pig. And I realized that I used to now in the free time I had, I used to find there were a lot of Jewish, there was a lot of Jewish people living in Oran, and there was little there were factions there. There was a faction of Jewish, there was a faction of Arabs, and a French faction. There were three dominants. In '43, were were some of these people people who had fled Germany or Eastern Europe, or were they natives living there? There was some of them had fled. I suspect, probably suspect, they had fled to Eastern Europe. Europe, they got into uh, into French territory. I suspect. So they're all headed for Rix and Casablanca. Well, by this Trying time, to get the plane up to Portugal, isn't it? They made a movie out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oran was, because uh, um, that was a port, big port also, and that was the, the Free French had moved in, they were there, and we I remember seeing recovering ships and repairing ships and whatnot there. And uh, that there was a very, Arab, uh, very heavy Arab settlement. What was your job, your unit's job in Iran? Well, by this time, now we had moved up to uh, Iran, and we, we lost the division was being dismantled, so we were assigned to port facilities and guard facilities. Uh, now the guard facilities were protecting areas, uh, military areas. 
the port areas where such things as unloading, unloading ships, loading trucks, setting up convoys for supplies, that sort of thing, to go fill up the line. What kind of condition was Iran in when you got there? There was some, you could see there had been some, some uh, bombing and artillery damage. And it was, you could see that very, it, was, it was that way, you could see it. That, um, I think the Casablanca had more damage than Iran, as I, re, as I recall it. I recall it, yeah. <laughs> and how, how long were you in this area with your unit? Um, we went, uh, let's see, February, March. <coughs> I about three months because we were getting, we were, we were heading for Anzio. We were heading for Anzio Beach here, that's where we were heading for. Are right, you going to participate in the invasion at Anzio? Well, how, uh, that's the term is how to it has to be defined. We went, we unloaded ships there, we helped under fire unloaded ships in Anzio. At the beach house? That's right. Tell us about that. That's a pretty hairy place. <coughs> well, I had to go once. I had it once. It was scary because you not only had to worry about what was overhead, airplanes. You had the, always a possibility of uh, subs, U-boats out in the harbor, even though we were in there. And you had in front of you um, uh, uh, combat men plus artillery. <laughs> it was, had everything going for you. I mean, it was, a, it was a, so what our main position was to help was to establish beachheads for supplies, get supplies in there because there's no supplies you can't fight anyway. So periodically a ship would come in and we'd load a ship and go up there. Now I only went up once because by the time I became um, <clears throat> Uh, battalion, um, we call it 504, 405 Port Battalion. I was the one that I became a battalion operational officer. The operational officer got killed or something other, and I was working in the in the office there, in the operation office per se. And so Major, I can't get the Major's name. He told me later on. He. Uh, he said, well, go outside and go, you and you over there, you know what's going on. So I was, for duty purposes, I was an operations officer. Although I was only a sergeant. Is that better than being a warrant officer? Well, the money would have been different. But I was doing the work of an officer. I was doing the office of a major. That's right. You, you had a higher rank than you would have gotten at school. I, I want to go back a minute to your being on the beach. Uh, were, were you ever bombed or strafed or under aerial attack? Well, yeah, I, I remember, uh, I think the most memorial one was that uh, the night before Mother's Day, 1944, we were down on the, on, uh, that was in, I guess when I got back to Naples, we were loading a ship and the air raid sounded and was, here we go. So this, we were told to uh, go to a safety, I was told to go to this, this area it was like a shelter-like thing. Every shelter was. Well, I told my guys, I said, guys, let's, do you want to go back to some safety? Stay with me. Well, they guys, they, they kind of like a little size anyway. So I had all the guys, I told them to wet up your, put a mud, oh, your hands over your face and I'll, and stay enough, I'd get you out of here. And I got them out of there. The next point, I went back down there and where we were supposed to go, wasn't there. It had been hit, I take it. Mm-hmm. See, my hope would soon. That was, that, that was, the other was another time we were in a building getting some rest. At what port I was in, and we got another air raid sound off and um, <clears throat> This captain told him to take him downstairs. So I told the guys, he told the guys, go down and go this direction. Yeah, I said, look, stay with me. If the plane, if we were here, and the planes were coming this direction, if they dropped a bomb, a bomb by force, physically check that bomb was going to come that direction. 
So the best way is to move in the direction which they were coming. And I, t I refused to take them in that area. I took them to another area altogether, and the next morning, the area was all, was, wasn't there. I think after a while, people are going to feel you're lucky, right? I had, well, my, but the, the men who were in my own platoon, they liked, uh, I used to, I fought for them. I thought, well, I never, I tell you this, the first night, I had taken a patrol out, uh, patrol, the, patrol in the area. I was new to this outfit. I was new. So the first sergeant told me, gave my assignment, and he told the, uh, the name of the guys who were going to go with me, et cetera. So I said, okay, I'll be in the command tent at so and so a time. We'll move out at whatever time it's supposed to be. So I went out there, so before we had a formation, I called names, I called, and nobody answered at all. No one. So I went to the command post, and I just sat there, my, and I don't know, one guy came in, and they said, well, Sergeant, I figured you'd be by yourself, I'll come up with you. And one by one, they all came in. And these guys had all been real cavalrymen, because they have been cavalrymen from the word go, from the very beginning, from Fort Huachuca. I was a complete stranger to them in the northern too. And one fellow said, you know, Sergeant Gore, if you would told on us, you would have bought the fire. You would have had it. You would have had it. And I told him, I said, I've never done that because I backed on you being nice fellows. And those men stay with me for the rest of my tour of duty all the way to Japan. And you did not say anything bad about their Sergeant. You used the phrase, we were going out on patrol. Tell me about going out on patrol. Well, what that what meant was there do? were areas that we had to go on uh, patrol, guard, take care of, because they were all infiltrators going anyway. And uh, that area, is, uh, it's, I never knew what was in that area, but I had to patrol this area. I had this with the perimeter. And uh, I'll never get the first night. This, um, Major Evans, I said, well, I said, it's what about the ammo? I said, well, you got enough ammo for five rounds of men? I said, no, no, so I'm not going to take those men out there for that. So I want some ammo. He said, well, you're afraid they might get hurt. He was a southerner also, see. So uh, I said, I'm going to have ammo. He said, well, he made a degree. He said, well, you, we'll give you the ammo, but you keep it close to you. So then I said, also, I said, I want somebody some hot coffee and just late at night to keep these men going. So said, well, we never did it before. I said, I've got to have it. So wild up with it, I got my ammo and I got my hot coffee for my men. And the only other men before me had taken groups out like that, never got this sort of thing. They never asked for it. So I got to have this sort of thing. And um, we patrolled this area, make sure there's no vents, because we never knew who was around. Every once in a while you find a German soldier, a couple of them, two or three together. They weren't necessarily out to shoot up anybody, but they were guys who were separate from the units. They were hungry. They were, looking for, they were hungry. You like how they were hungry. And they just went to find, find food. And that was the only type of patrol that I ever had to do. You've mentioned Anzio. You've mentioned uh, <coughs> Naples. And you're in the spring of 44. D-Day is, is looming not far north of you, mm -hmm. at least on the coast of Europe. Did you have any connection with that operation? No. We, the nearest I can, I, we finally found a with a fault. We did a false thing that we made like a false move towards southern France. And uh, that's, uh, that's the move, but we didn't get in there. It's when it started in that direction. And that was sort of a diversion. Yeah. But we came right back to, uh, we went from Naples up to Piombino and another town further up near, further north. In fact, when the war got over, I was up near, up near the Genoa somewhere the other. But uh, we didn't get into the, into, we didn't actually go into, just into uh, southern France. And we didn't go into D-Day at all. So you say the war was over uh, when you were in Genoa? Yeah, just below Genoa, yeah. Okay. It's uh, the war in Europe was over. War in Europe. 
Uh, did you guys think you were going home, or did you feel, oh boy, there's a boat to sail into Japan? We felt we were going to go home, but knowing my luck, I knew better. Yeah. Back up a second to the end of the <coughs> war in Europe. That's an exciting thing. We, well, I wish I had, but I, um, I got a letter that I wrote my mother. One hour after the war ended, I still have that letter that she saved it, which was to let him know I was safe. Yeah. And Thanksgiving for being safe. If I can find it, I'll, I'll make a package and just send it out. You might want to look at it. We would appreciate having yeah. that if you could do that. But my first thing I did. Uh, was to kneel in prayer and thank God for being spared. Also add to that that you saved the lives of a lot of your own men. You're in Italy. Yes. Uh, the war in Europe's over and a lot of guys are going home because they'd been in Europe for God knows how long. When did you get the word as to where you were going? We went to a staging area and we thought we were getting staging ready to go home. And uh, we went to another port and got on board a ship. The name of the ship was the USS Uruguay. It was originally the USS Constitution, which was a pleasure via, via, uh, ship before the war. It was converted f for troop usage, the USS Uruguay. And we pulled anchor May 30th, at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I didn't get off that ship until we got to the Panama Canal. We stayed in the Panama Canal overnight and uh, set sail again, and I got off that ship on the morning of July 17th. That's a long sea voyage. You're right. And you went through the canal. Well, we got to the canal. See, if you get, you have to get to the canal before. I think it's three o'clock. Was be the deadline. You had, you had to be. You, know, you had to be leaving the canal by by uh, by three. Because of the locks, but not the security sort of thing. We got there a little bit after, so we stayed overnight. But we were surrounded by troops all night long. We were allowed to get off and lay on the docks and whatnot. The next morning, we got up on our way to go again. Before we get too far away from Europe, did you have any opportunity to see any? When you oh, were yes. I had the uh, experience. I had uh, I was, had the honor, whatever you want to call it, of meeting, of going, went to, to Rome, to St. Peter's. And I met and had a pleasure shaking the hand of the, of the Pope. Did you really? That's right. And he spoke few languages. When I indicated that I was from, from New England, greater Boston area, he kind of smiled and mentioned that he had been in this area at one time. Now, did he understand your English? <laughs> yes. Because only a minute, about a minute or so. But we had a chance to say, of course, most I'm not Roman Catholic, but the other Catholics were, were kissing the papal ring. I just merely shook his head and touched the ring. And uh, that was a momentous That's quite moment. an event. I went all the way through the, to the building, up to the very top, up to the gold. Oh, at St. Peter's? At St. Peter's, very top of the eye. Uh, Biggest dome the Sistine, in Europe. Sistine Chapel, and I, I observed a mass. In fact, I attended a mass at the, the Sistine Chapel. And um, went all through the, the the whole Vatican area, went to the Colosseums, been time to the Colosseums, the places I had read about, heard about, and taught about in the school, the Latin, all through there. And I also had to to um, leaning tower Pisa. And you've, the, they've fixed it since you've been there. Oh yeah, I just got repaired about it. I just, well, the completion was just complete. They just completed about six months ago. Yeah. Uh, the skull of Galileo was this was hit the the tomb where he was buried. It cracked, and you can see his skull in, inside there. Yeah, 
I went through the, it, that was a very momentous spot. And um, those are the two most important ones, I think, I think. Oh, um, uh, Mount Vesuvius had had a little problem, had their own private war for a short while. And uh, it was just cooling down when we got there. That's right. It erupted uh, in That's the right. Bay of Naples. That's right. Did you get over to Capri? I went over there. Good for yeah. you. Now, in fact, I brought home a uh, relic of a, a coin that was embedded in some of the ash. Brought it home, yeah. So when you sailed out of Genoa, <coughs> you had to go through the Straits of Gibraltar. Went through the Straits of Gibraltar. That's really a beautiful thing to see. And so you saw the Rock of Gibraltar. That's right. Then there's a lot of ocean down to the Panama. You're on your way to, uh, directly to the Philippines, is that right? Yes. And it took you five or six weeks to get there. That's right. Let me say the interesting thing about um, coming through our waters is that we knew within, you could, we, we knew when we were approaching land, even though you never saw it. You see, the, there were porpoises, you see them in the air, uh, uh, coming out of the water. And we knew that we were within, a hundred miles of, of land. It smells different, too. Yeah. <coughs> Philippine Islands, where did you land? Just outside of Manila. And the Manila had been thoroughly flattened before you got there? It had been beaten up. I mean, it was pretty well beaten up. Did you get ashore there and get to see the city? Yes, I did. Uh, um, we had a the, you know, we had a spot where we were encamped outside of Manila, and uh, the, so we were the first week or so just laying around. You know, we used to take I used to take my men down to the swimming pool. Well, I used to go to my go to the company headquarters and first in the morning and ask what's my duty for the day, and they say, well, we'll let you know. So I used to take the men down to the swimming pool. You say why you do that? They were going to go anyhow. They were going to go anyhow. There's no way I'm going to be able to watch 20 guys. So I just get a truck, take them down there, and bring them back for lunch. Maybe port to the office, nothing, take them back down there. It was just easier, easy way than having them go open off. And that's how we worked out. Then we, about a second week or so, we were assigned to, uh, to one of the depots to um, get ready for the invasion. Now, the interesting thing about being in there, the first week or so there, I think it was the second morning, some, we had called for a uh, uh, for meeting, somebody called a thing. There's a lieutenant then, he's gonna teach us uh, firearms, gonna teach us. I said, Lieutenant, are you kidding me? Is this for me? I was fresh anyway. Yeah, that's probably why I never got, got my warrant. <laughs> I said, I said, hey, Lieutenant, how long have you been in the in the army? He told me, I said, you know, I got more gold brick time. You got service. So I said, I'm not going to. My men are not going to go for this business. You're going to teach us uh, lock and load sort of things. So we come out of been in Europe all this time here. So you get your your if your, your arms go bad, you throw them away and get a new one. I said, no, I'm not going to throw my men. And I took my men out out of a formation. So he went and asked. Captain Burns, I think it was Captain Burns, who was this fresh little sergeant, said, well, Captain Burns said, don't bother him, let him alone, don't bother him. So he, when you need him, he'll be there. But, because uh, I felt sorry for the poor lieutenant, he didn't know anything about it. I said, you're talking to a bunch of guys who've been roughing for two new years, you know, not nobody kids out of it. So that's happened. Then they had, uh, that was one interesting thing. We, then we were loading, probably working up this, getting ready for an invasion. And uh, next thing, they were on board a ship. No, let's just back, just back up a second. You're getting ready for the invasion of the Japanese homelands. That's right. What specifically did you do? What, what did your <coughs> outfit do? Getting ready? Yeah. Loading ships. Tell us about yeah. loading a ship that's going to sail to Japan in the middle of the greatest invasion in history? Well, the, the supplies would be, be drunk. We, uh, the supplies we brought to the, uh, to, the, to the docks 
the ships would be there when we we told we was it was all laid it's all everything's all laid out for you which what's going to go where and this sort of sort of thing and our job was to load the ships and get the uh, and get them ready for an invasion and uh uh when the war ended actually when the when the bomb was dropped we were out we were out on the Japanese sea. You were at sea? Yeah. Headed for where? Japan. With an invasion fleet? Yeah. Can you talk about any of the large ships around you or the uh, um, warships that were with you? Like, all we just look at was so was ships, 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 all we saw was ships, ships, ships. No, well, the, the battle plan, I was not aware of it. We and, went. <laughs> and I, I could uh, have lost some track of time here, but the Battle of Okinawa is still going on, isn't that correct? Well, I think the Okinawa thing was over when I got there. And just had, it was, yeah, it was over. Okinawa was over with. But we got, see, we didn't get, we went into Japan in 1945. You know, Wagadopa in Europe, 45. And we went, and then uh, the Okinawa thing was over in the... In the Okinawa uh, began the 1st of April in 45. But we didn't get the, to, we didn't get to the Philippine Islands until, until uh, July. Okay, so Okinawa is just about yeah. secure. Yes. And you guys are sailing to Japan. Yeah. Can you tell us what you felt like uh, at sea? Heading uh, off on uh, what would be a, a large invasion. Well, we're just wondering what it was going to be like. And I do know, I say this, that um, we would have been, would have been slaughtered. We'd have lost, we'd have been, we'd have lost a, a million men easily, because well, if I can make it, can you imagine coming into? Uh, let me see what we would be a place. They Revere Beach, but on the beach you'd be up it was on a hill. So you're coming off out of the water up a hill. So all you need is one man up on top of the hill with a machine gun, playing target. That's all you would need. And then we we went in that morning, early that morning. Uh, got off the, even though the bomb had been dropped and uh, things were cooling off, we didn't know what we were going into. We went in. In combat, combat array, and with the orders, climb out the skiff, hit the beach, and run for the hill. And uh, two reasons: run for the hill to get anybody who might be there, and also to make room for somebody else. Because if you didn't, you're going to have a traffic jam. At, at yeah, come, come there. like Normandy. Yeah, and uh, and then we picked out a spot for us. And then there were supply ships coming in, and we started immediately unloading ships. And uh, that was, they, the Japanese people were very nice, though. They, they had realized that they had lost the war, and they're very, very cooperative. Very, very cooperative, uh, uh, as we met them, even under those circumstances. It was a nice, I think it was a nice tour of duty. So you got to Japan. That, mm -hmm. that was the uh, just another country that you've gotten to, another culture. Uh, tell us about contact with the Japanese. Well, I say they're very. I think they're very, very polite people. Very polite people, and um, they accepted life as it was. The emperor had said this was going to happen, and blah blah. And I think that the, I think it was a, I, I have a very high, high respect for God for them. They would the poor Japanese soldier and the poor Yankee soldier were two guys who were forced to do something they didn't want. They would have done normally. I would never have done this normally, would I? No. And that poor Japanese soldier would have done it normally. So we're just two persons who were the victim of circumstances. Yeah. Who were making history. Yuli, how long were you in Japan? <coughs> uh, was it August, September, October, November? Pulled anchor on the 10th of uh, December. 
to come home. Forty-five. Forty-five, yeah. Almost, almost six months. <clears throat> and then it, this is a, this is a cute one: is that coming home, I left a bunch of fellows there. And when I finally got home, they had left after I left Japan and were home and out. I came home back through the Panama Canal. Did they fly home? They got fast ships and went to the West Coast. <laughs> I came back to the, through the canal zone. You just loved that Panama Canal, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> we got, <laughs> I, in fact, I had, uh, I passed into the, I passed the date line twice. I had two Christmases, in fact. Hit the so you made out like a bandit. <laughs> then coming up, um, coming out of the canal, heading north, I came like I remember seeing come up to Cape Hatteras. Beautiful sight, seeing Cape Hatteras how it erupts. You get two different types of water, and it's, it's very roughy there all the time. And it came into New York Harbor, and. Uh, New York Harbor and got moved over to Jersey. And then three days there, and overnight, we got a train that brought us into Camp Devons. Got here on a sunny morning. And uh, it was cute. I got, I, I, I just, like, I got home. I went home, came home. To, and I got to the house, and there was nobody there. Oh, what a welcome. Well, no one expected me. So I went around the corner to my aunt's house, and she was in. I said, uh, well, she was so happy to see you. So I called the house, and why did somebody answer the phone? And I said, um, you want to see your brother, or do you want to see your brother? And they said, oh, yeah. And so I hung up on and walked around the house, around the corner. They didn't know it was a joke or not, and there I was, my family. So Mama said, when will you be home? I said, well, I'll be, I should be home by Wednesday, because I was just shooting off at the mouth. 6.30 Wednesday night, I walked in the house. A civilian. <laughs> Were you totally out, military obligation finished? Yes. That was it? That was it. You were home. I, out, O-U-T, out. <laughs> My mother said, well, you're, I said, I'm not gonna keep any of that. She said, well, you might need them against the moment. If I get called back to duty, they who call me, let them give me the clothes. I'm not keeping any of that stuff at all. And so if you want it, you, know, you can keep it, but none of it. I, well, I did keep one uniform for ceremonial purposes, because I had gone to join the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and that was the first uniform, but I got rid of all that stuff. The rest went out. Then, it, then I got home, uh, that was Wednesday. The following uh, Sunday, I went to church Sunday, and the choir master, I sang in the Episcopal Church Choir, and he said, Eulis, I have a job for you. And he said, be at 50 Congress Street tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. He's going to work for F.S. Mosley. It was a big stock brokers. And next morning, I went for F.S. Mosley. That was hard, wasn't it? <laughs> F.S. And, and I don't know about the, the, who the Mosleys were. They, uh, you've heard of, uh, in Beverly, Rantoul Street? Yeah. That's a family. They ran too. They own that town. Neil ran too. The story about Neil ran too. The Illinois, the Illinois Central. That was the only line that ran from the north clean down to, the, to Louisiana, down to the Gulf. That was owned by the, by the ran too family. And the story is that for, his, for Neil's 21st birthday, that his father gave him the railroad. That's the story. <laughs> He asked for a train, and he got a train. <laughs> the, now, interesting to tie that was that some years later, <clears throat> I was at the military school as a civilian uh, in Rantoul, Illinois. And um, I was at the station, going up to Kankakee one, and I was talking with a man, we're talking, and he's telling me about the celebration they just had of the town, yet, 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 yet. And he said that no, this uh, Mr. Van Tool was there. So you mean you see a tall man, bald, with an ear? He says, yeah. So I worked for him. His name is Neil Van Tool. Neil Van Tool, uh, Harriet's 
grandchildren. They were cousins of the Shantanus dolls. That's a nice family. <laughs> and the Mosleys. Well, yeah. But that's what my first, that was my first job. Within a couple of days after getting out of the military. Really, you had a, a long career in the Army and you went a lot of places, <coughs> did a lot of things. Is there one most memorable experience <coughs> in your career that you would tell us about? Good. My total career, my total in, life? In the Army, if you could pick out one thing that you think about say, more than anything else, what would it be? Gee, I don't know. Uh, the question is not, doesn't come out right. What would be the mo what would I remember most about everything? When you think of your years in the army, every once in a while, does one thing more than anything else come back into your mind? Yeah, getting out. Getting out. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, because all my memories are so, uh, I, I, I can't, uh, well, I, I, <coughs> maybe one of my encounters, one of my officers might have been, I don't know, uh, I can't think of this colonel's name, he, he, I had a, Occasionally, when an officer called me a liar, and I hit him. And when I hit him, my uh, driver grabbed me and said, let me have him. What had happened, we have a, it said Piambino, we put it go, go out and load a ship. And the, it was awful, the weather was terrible. The, 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 uh, the skiffs that we had to go out on, they were jumping 20, 30 feet in the air. And the commander of the ship said, you can't take him on here, because it's, it's it's too dangerous. So it was raining every day. I was, I didn't mind the rain, but so I um, told the men, well, let's, I'll take you back. And this captain come down and uh, what I got some words and he called me a liar and I, without thinking I hit him. So I went back to command headquarters. It was Colonel Arthur Geeson, he was from West Virginia. I said, Captain Gill, I'm going to see you. He said, what's right? I said, Colonel Gill, I just hit Captain Taylor. I said, Captain, I said, if you call me a liar, I'll hit you too. And I told him, I said, when he called me a liar, he came out of his uniform. I said, and I got 235 men who will tell you he hit me. And now I'm ready for a general court martial. And that was the end of that, that was the end of that one. I think Captain Hill had moved. I think he could, well, it took me away from him anyway. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, the next and, question is, was there a most memorable character other than this, in this incident? Some guy you remember or somebody over the years that you were in the Army? You know, this colonel, he's from Texas, and I always think about it, right minute is he, his name fills me this minute. And the reason I think so much about him because of, um, he was from Texas too. But we used to talk a lot. One day he said to me, he said, you know, so I can go, he said, I'm gonna have a hard time going back to Texas. He said, I never realized, because he, well, he was, he wasn't racist, but that way he was raised. He said, you know that we went up a hill, he said, if one, the two things happened and said, hey, we had to take on a hill. He said, one German would have killed us all. He said, and I realized that moment that there's no difference between the other. He said, I realized after a couple of bombings that the bombs don't have anybody's name on them, we have anybody's color or race on it. And he, he, he entirely changed. And I, he, oh, what is his name? I can see him now. I can see, in fact, they, he, he's, he's a, he was the type of guy that, remember once um, there was a, a captain called up for his assignment. I said, they aren't ready yet, and he used some profanity at me. He was out of Jersey, redhead. 
So uh, I hung up very politely. So when Colonel, when he came in, I said, Colonel, I got to speak to you. Can I ask you a couple of questions? What is the sergeant go? I said, is the military code say something about an officer being a gentleman or something like that? I said, yeah. I said, well, I'm confused. I said, why? I said, well, would you call an officer a gentleman who would swear at his subordinates? He said, no. I said, well, Captain Haynes just swore at me. I said, he just swore me on the tell him. I said, yeah. I said, get him on the phone. I want to see him right now. He said, okay, what is he doing? I want him. So I sent him and got him up there. He went in the office. And this colonel chewed him up. He, he worked him over. And he came out and he said, and he told him, now you will report to the operations officer, Sergeant Gore, uh, every hour on the hour, and you're going to be OD, officer of the day, f for a week. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, and he made him apologize to me. So Captain Games came back and he said, Jesus, Sergeant, I said, I got a date in town. And I said, I, said, I, I, I don't give the orders. <laughs> I'd love to do something for you. <laughs> so uh, after about three days, I went to the, to the colonel. I said, Let's, we, he's had enough. Mm. But he, that colonel, I remember him so much because he could have, um, I, because of the fact that, he really, that because of the combat experience, he had been a combat officer, made life change, change because he saw that life was so different. And then that he demanded that his officers respect all of his men, regardless of who they were. You know what's going to happen? That name's going to come to me when I walk out that door, and I can't think of that name. I want to say Davis, not it's not Davis. I'll I'll call you and, I'm going to call you and tell you that name. <laughs> Did you join any reserve unit after you got home? <coughs> Uh, the answer to that is yes and no. Let me explain that. In 1960, 59, the Air Force, by the time the Air Corps had become a separate entity from the Air, from the, from the Army, and the Air Force put together a, a, a uh, department of anal analysis department and a statistician department, and uh, so to get, for the reserves, to get it into the reserves, the federal government gave an examination for the, this, specific, this specific type of position with a lot of requirements behind it, which I was able to fulfill. Because by this time I had gone through graduate from college and that sort of crap like that. And um, I took this examination, but I forget it. And the group here, I was, there were eight of us took it, and I had topped the list. Eight took it, and I think it was three passed it. I topped the list. The only thing wrong with that position was that I had to become a member of the Army, the the the, the, Air, the uh, Air Force Reserve, because I was working with the reserves. This is so that the, the reserves have a nuclear, the military always have a nuclear person they can put their hands on. So we were called. Air Force Reserve Technicians. And the ranks went from colonels down to down to sergeants. So in order to accept the position, I did join the reserves. Mm -hmm. So did I voluntarily in order to get in order to get the best part of the ice cream, I had to take the spoon. <laughs> That's very well put. Are you currently a member uh, of any veterans organizations then? In veterans organizations? Yeah. I am at present time the commander of the Taylor Post Veterans of Foreign Wars in Cambridge. Uh, this is interesting because my first tour, my first uh, commandership was in 1950, I guess it was. But uh, I have now again the, the through attrition. Oh, we had a the, we had a command. He was moving to South Carolina, and uh, behind my back, a group 
No one wanted the job, but could one felt they could do the job. So behind my back, I didn't know anything about it. I was elected and named the president of the commander of the, of the post. And next, the guys brought the stuff to my house, and I've been a commander of a center for about five years. Uh, the post was going, was dying. I mean, stands the reason it was falling apart, and there's. So we're, we're down from two, so we're down to 20 members now, and I'm in command of the post. I am also, we have the Cambridge Veterans Organization in Cambridge, which I was one of the organizers, and um, comprised of all the veterans posts in the city. We've, we've come from 50 posts down to, down to 10. I have been the, I have served as president of that organization also. I have served as a chaplain for over 15 years or so, and I served as treasurer for about 10 years or so. That because then about the organization was dying, and uh, a lot of things going on, and I just on my own pulled the organization back together. So I'm still the I'm still the chaplain, I'm still the treasurer of Cambridge Veterans Organization. And um, that's what my involvement city-wise here. So, well, for me, I've been a, I was, I was a state uh, chief, of, not chief, uh, chief inspector for the state of Massachusetts for the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And I was county commander of all of Middlesex County of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. I've served in that. And I've served in um, other inspecting. And uh, when there's no one else around to do it, I guess I get the job. <laughs> Evidently. You told us a little bit a moment ago about your reception coming home and talking to your sister and your family. When, when you did come home, did you discuss with your uh, spouse or family or anybody else what you had done in the service what had happened to you? I was single. Uh, I was single. That was that was not a traumatic thing, but uh, I had never been married. Um, I got out. I was out, and there was just another chat in my book, and I picked up a new book. Now, interesting that uh, the nearest thing to every discussion about military was was in 1985. Back my brother's funeral, in fact. The, the discussion about my sister was blabbing about something or other, and she said to me, so you wouldn't know because you weren't even there. So I said, what do you think I was doing in Europe? Playing cards? So you don't know what I was doing. I said, who would want to, I was, my baby sister, so the one is the baby too. She did, so my other sister dropped and said, that you don't know what you was going to do because he never told us. And I never talked about what I did. I never talked about it. Now my daughter, a couple Wait a minute. Please tell us why. Why why didn't you tell your family? I think it was important. I wasn't gonna tell them about my love life and I didn't think it was important. So my went, your brother went in the military, he spent the time there, three or four years, whatever it was, and he did what he was supposed to do and he was forced he came home. And I said, I'm not a hero, I'm just a guy who did what he had to do. Now my kids have asked me one more, well daddy, what did you do? And I said, I just went in there and did what I had to do. They said, we never talk about it. I said, no, there's nothing we're talking about. And I never, uh, I got, I have medals and whatnot, I don't know, they're somewhere still in the drawer. I gave, one of my nephews should take my whole his pants up or something. And I never, I just, uh, it never, I never got hung up on it. Now, it got interesting <laughs> that my middle daughter, when I was in the reserves, um, she used to love to see me in my uniform. She loved it. She loved the uniform. And when I'd come home from reserves, I said, yeah, she always had a bunch of kids to see her daddy in the yeah, uniform. Right. She loved, loved to see me in the uniform. But I was never hung up with it. However, uh, I, I've been called, I've talked to kids, young people in the students and schools I've been called school and sort of like that. But uh, what the Ulysses do? You ever take the few officers, made a few people mad, that, uh, did what he had to do and came home. What did you <coughs> think 
then about the war you were involved in and the aims of the war and, and what do you think about it now? Has your ideas about it changed over the years? As far as between the, between the nations? Yeah, World War II. Uh, what did you think about it when you first went in? Your motivation. And what do you think about it now? Has that changed at all your ideas? I didn't have any motivation. The only motivation I had was to get out and get home. I, I wasn't flag waving. I was not, I'm going to tell you, I was not flag waving. I get called to do a job, and I gave it my all. That was uh, give my all. Uh, I realized that there were some things going on in, in, uh, in Europe that shouldn't happen, but I knew there were things happening in Sudan that shouldn't be happening either at the same time. So if you ask, if you, your question come, ties down to was I, was the patriotism involved here? No. But I love my, I love my nation. And my nation said, you really want you to do something. And I said, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And I let them, they, that, that's, that's the only way I can answer that. Can you look back and... Uh remember the reception you got when you came home. You were returning home from the wars. Can you compare that with uh, the reception guys who were in Korea or Vietnam? And I came on the sub, I, I, got, I took the train from Fort Devens, and I got off in, uh, in, um, at North Station with my bag. He had to fight my way on to get on the, on the trolley to get to Park Street. He had to fight my way on the train to come to Cambridge. And I come up out of Cambridge, in Central Square, and I bumped, the first person I bumped into was, uh, was uh, Cy Rosenberg. I sold newspapers when I was a kid. He said, hi, how are you? Yak, 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 glad you're home. And, I went, and that was it. And um, there was no big hallelujah and when I, I was home. I, do admit, I went to church on, on Sunday, which I went anyway, and I don't know the, the uh, the pastor asked me to stand up and acknowledge my presence, glad to see me home. And uh, that was it. And there was no big hell of blue about my being home. You're home. That's, I'm home. That just, it, yeah. Ulysses is home, so he's home. One last question. Is there anything I haven't asked you here today, or is there <laughs> Any last thing you'd like to say to people who are going to be watching this tape a long, long time from now? I'm glad that when the, I was needed, uh, I was able to respond. And I'm glad that I was able to, do, to respond and do what I should have done and to return home. Uh, and I think. I do regret that we have raised a generation, and on a second generation, that matter, of young people who, who are enjoying things they do not understand what it costs to have these things they are now enjoying. And I, I wish we could do, I'm not wishing, I'm doing all I can to do this. And the way I'm doing it, I stay heavily involved in schools. I do it, for instance, um, each year at Veterans Day, I personally take flags to, this, to one of the schools, distribute to the kid, to the students there, and answer their questions. I don't talk, I let them ask me questions, I ask their questions about this, that, and the other. And I, I, I wish that more of us were doing that sort of thing. And I think that would solve a lot of the problems that we, we have and think we have. Because we've lost, uh, we have, a, two generations of very disrespectful people. And it's not their fault. They weren't taught respect. <coughs> I don't know if this makes sense or not. I don't know if it makes sense, but that's how I, I feel. And I've, and I've done this with my own children, with my grandchildren, and I'll do it with my great-grandchildren. I, I, I close it, let's make it sound right. 
My oldest daughter, some we were having some words one day because she was thinking I was so funny duddy. And I said to her, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to answer, I'm going to honest answer, and I'll act accordingly. I said, do you want me to change the way I am so that you get things be better for you? And she looked at me and smiled. Said, Daddy, please don't change. See, because I know that no matter what I do, that I can look out there and you're always going to be there. I have a rock I can hold on to. And I think that my generation, the generation behind me, need, that's what we need to do. Don't change. Be, be firm. Be steadfast. And give our young people something to hold on to. Julie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Well, thank you for putting up with my gabbing.